So hi, I'm Konstantin. I'm going to talk about contact prediction and distance prediction today. So I figured I should start with this slide, right? You've seen this a couple of times already at the beginning of a couple of lectures. And uh, it's good to start with this as well because, um, well, this is right in the middle of our topic for today. So if you recall, um, moving between 2D and 3D is actually not that challenging. Actually, my pointer, okay, it works. It's a bit small, right? Okay, so moving between 2D and 3D is not that challenging, right? If you have the structure from PDB, for example, you can easily compute a distance map or a contact map out of that. The only thing that you lose is the mirroring information, right, when you want to go back. And if you want to go back from such a perfect distance or contact map, it's not a problem. There are tools which are um, actually able to uh, recalculate the original 3D structure, right? But on the other hand, going from 1D to 2D, that's a bit more challenging, and this is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Now. Mostly this is kind of a stepping stone, right? If you want to have a contact map or distance map, usually your goal is then to use this as kind of a set of constraints for a folding process, which then infers the full 3D structure, right? So this is something important to keep in mind because we uh, will talk about that a bit more when we come to metrics, how to measure quality of a predictor. So. Um, I will first give you a bit of background, I will first talk about um, contact and distance prediction in general um, and give you another short introduction into deep learning. Sorry for the guys who already worked with deep learning, it's going to be a bit repetitive but it's important to be on the same page here. <laughs> so first about the problem in general, what are we trying to do? So you see here for one PDB ID, one CHD, same sample, one contact map, and one distance map. Now, as you can already see, there's a big difference between both, right? For a contact map, the story is really black and white. It's just binary. We want to know, is there a contact or no contact? And this is based on kind of an arbitrary threshold, right? We use 8 angstrom here. Um, 8 angstrom is simply the standard now in the field, mostly because CUSP uses it. And since everyone wants to compare with the results from CUSP, well, obviously everyone uses this threshold. It could be something else, but it's going to be 8 angstrom for, for most methods. Um, so everything below 8 angstrom, uh, in particular the C beta distance of each residue is that below, angst, uh, below 8 angstrom, we call it a contact, otherwise it's no contact. Now of course we have no information on how uh, far these residues are actually apart. For that we actually need the distance map and as you can see here this is a more colorful story. Uh, there's much more going on, you can see much more of the structure actually. And it's also more natural because it's not based on this kind of arbitrary threshold which could pose some problems for machine learning devices as you can imagine. Now, predicting distances, however, is a bit tricky. Many people have tried to do that because it is better to have that. It's much more information dense, right? It's better to have these constraints for the folding later on. But the problem is it's not easy to predict them. So many people tried over the years. And obviously, obviously since the distances are real valued, most people tried regression. And it didn't quite work. So contact prediction simply worked much better. So this was the official category in CASP, for example. Now, what people lately tried to do, though, was to kind of wrap this in a classification problem. They're not trying to infer the actual distances, but they say, okay, we have certain bins, and one bin represents distances between 0 and 2 angstrom, for example, the next one between 2 and 4, and something like that. And you could define like 20 bins, and the last bin is maybe everything above 20 angstrom, something like that. And that actually works fairly well. And um, the performance of these uh, devices is actually not much worse than just predicting contacts. So we're in a gradual shift right now where the most recent methods do the, contact predict uh, do the distance predictions and they then simply reduce it to a contact map to be able to compare to other methods for kind of historical reasons because that's the category in CASP still, right? How could you do that? Well, if you have these distance bins, how do you make a contact map out of that? Well, it's pretty easy. You just take all the bins representing the distances below 8 angstrom, you sum the probabilities up in there, and then you get the probability for contact and you've reduced it to a binary system, right? Some people call this a distogram, which I think is a neat term, maybe that sticks around. So that's what we do, but how do we do it? So since 2012, basically, all of the methods in contact and distance prediction use evolutionary information. And that, this kind of makes sense. I think Professor Rost already introduced the idea, so I'm going to keep it a bit more brief. So basically, we are looking at a sequence, at a multiple sequence alignment, and we're trying to find columns which are um, correlated, where we have correlated mutations, right? So for example, here, this column and this column. You always have the S at this position with the T here or the A with the S. So either both mutate or non-mutate. So why is that? Well, 
if they are actually correlated, which means they are actually close in space, and that means if one mutates and the residue gets a little larger, for example, the other residue has to change as well, because otherwise it might break the structure, then it might break the function, and if this protein is somehow vital, then the organism will not be able to live. And the consequence is we cannot observe it, right? And this is really the crucial point. We only observe what works, okay? So, we're looking for that in multiple sequence alignments. The more sequences we have, the better, of course, because the more correlations we can find. Um, for some proteins, this is obviously a problem. If we cannot find many evolutionary-related sequences, what do we do? Well, this is what many people work on nowadays, and we try to move away from evolutionary information, also uh, because of computational complexity, because actually computing such an MSA is very time-consuming, and in most methods, this is actually the bottleneck. Uh, let's assume you trained a machine learning device. Um, this might take a while, but it, when it's trained in the end, the inference is usually very fast, right? But you can only leverage that if um, you can generate your inputs fast enough, right? It doesn't help you if your neural network in the forward pass just takes a couple milliseconds if it takes a full day to compute an MSA for a new sample, right? So that's a problem. So we try to move away from that, but still not quite successfully. So pretty much all methods still use this evolutionary information. Okay, so on a more technical level, um, what do we actually try to do? Well, at first we want to compute these evolutionary coupling scores and we use some DCA tools for that. Direct coupling analysis is the method of choice here. There are a couple of methods that can do that. CCMPRED, for example, EV couplings and many more. Uh, CCMPRED, for example, has the advantage of being GPU accelerated. And since we're doing machine learning and deep learning, we train on GPUs anyway, so it makes sense to kind of accelerate this process as well. Uh, makes it a little faster. So. What we get out are correlation scores for each residue pair, i and j, right, i and j. And for each position there, we actually have 21 times 21 features resulting from that, because we have 20 amino acids plus a gap character in our alignments, right? And we have all possible combinations, and we get the correlation scores out of this, right? So in the end, we have a tensor with size L times L times 21 times 21, L being the length of a protein, or from a deep learning perspective, we just consider this as one depth dimension, so it's L times L times 441. Now this is pretty big, as you can imagine, right? For a large protein with hundreds of residues, let's say 800 residues, this can be gigabytes in size. This is already a bit challenging. If you want to use this as an input in, in a machine learning system, well, you need to handle that correctly. Now, what you can do is you can conflate all these channels and produce just one channel. And this is what you can see here on the left, kind of, the projectile is not showing this quite clearly, but what you can see is that uh, there's, there's at least a little bit of, of the full contact map, this is the ground truth on the structure, at least a bit of that is already covered, but it's very noisy. And in fact, tools like CCM PRED, hence the PRED in the name, prediction, were actually used as contact predictors, but well, they have been superseded now by, by more sophisticated systems, but it's a good starting point, and this is exactly what we're trying to do. Basically, we're trying to um, develop a good machine learning system that takes these uh, correlation scores, not the conflated one, but actually the, the full one, and infer contact or distance maps from that, okay? So input is L times L times 441. Output is either L times L times 1 for a contact map, since it's just binary, or L times L times B, B being the number of bins that we use, which we could try to find out empirically. And if you worked a little bit with deep learning, this already almost looks like an image translation problem or an image enhancement problem, and you could actually view it like that, right? So we could say that we actually want to find a system that does some kind of denoising in a very sophisticated way, right? We want to include domain knowledge to be able to get a more crisp uh, contact or distance map out of this. So and for that, we need deep learning. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the very basics of CNN since this was already introduced uh, by Michael, for example. So um, just as a, as a reminder, this is one of the more traditional CNNs. This is not really used anymore, but this was uh, basically the starting point for image classification, for example, or, or object detection and images, where you use a convolution kernel which moves across the full input uh, and computes feature maps. And you, at least in the traditional scenario, you try to reduce the image size, you downsampled that, used max pooling for that, and uh, produced ever more feature maps. And in the end, you have some fully connected layers going into some classification, for example. But this is not really what we're using anymore. So, uh, especially for our scenario where we have a large complex output, we do something else. Um, I want to briefly go into the uh, math of convolution kernels, though, because um, I think it's worthwhile to have another approach, kind of a different perspective on, on things. And especially this illustration from my experience really shows if you have understood it or not. So let's go through this, okay? 
So on the left side, you have the input volume. We have three feature channels, one, two, and three behind each other. They're just shown above in this case, right? Then we have a convolution kernel with size three by three moving across this. And it's currently at this position here, but it moves here across all the rows here, okay? Now, a convolution kernel has several different properties. The first thing is the size, obviously. It's three by three in this case. Then the other property is the padding that you apply. The padding is the amount of zeros that you add around your input. So the original input in this case was five by five, this bluish area in the middle, but we apply a padding of one, so we add these zeros, one layer of zeros basically around that. And the last important property of a convolution kernel is the stride, and that means how many positions, uh, or how many feature positions we move the kernel when we move it across the input. Uh, oftentimes we see a stride of one, so we just take every possible position, but we could have a stride of two, for example, when we want to model some downsampling, for example. And uh, one very important property of a convolution kernel is, is shown here. So these are the weights of this first kernel. Um, and you can see this kernel always stretches the full depth dimension, okay? So it moves across the input, in the width and height dimension, but it always takes the full depth into account. So it has weights for all three <coughs> feature channels. Now these weights are always going to be the same, no matter which position I place my convolution kernel. And this is the most important property actually of this kernel, because it is a uh, translation invariant. So wherever it is, it should always do the same job. So in other words, for, for image uh, translation problems or object detection, no matter where my object is in the image, I want to detect it, right? I don't want to detect it only if it's at a certain position. And this is very important and this is what convolution kernels can, can do. Now, one thing that confuses some people is while uh, a convolution kernel stretches the full depth of the input volume, it produces a single output channel, okay? So in the end, you always have uh, a corresponding number of output channels to the amount of um, kernels that you used. And this is one thing you need to simply try out. How many do you use? Sometimes 64, 128, depends on the problem. Uh, the more kernels you use, each kernel has different weights, you can extract more features out, right? But you add more free parameters. So it's kind of a thing to balance out when you develop this. Okay, so a bit of math behind the convolution kernels. So what's often important is to relate input and output size. Um, and we have a neat formula for that, for that. So for some given input size and output size, you might want to figure out how do I need to set my kernel size, my padding and my strides to make sure that the output has actually this, this form. And what you oftentimes want to do is you want to conserve the input size. And uh, to do that, well, you can plug in the numbers. You can see that there are several different combinations on how to do that. Of course, you can have a kernel one by one uh, and no padding and stride one. And you always have the same, the same output size as the input size. But you could also have larger kernels. This is what we normally do, a kernel size of five by five, for example. Then you have a padding of two and you get the same, the same output size again. Um, this is important for our case because remember, we are having L times L input and we are having L times L output. So there's no need to actually change the size. And since the size is dynamic, we also don't want to downsample or upsample because it could be something like 537 residues. You don't want to downsample that because how do you upsample then to the same size again? It's just problematic. Why would you do that? Okay, so let's take a look at more modern CNNs. How do they actually work? So in general, you have a building block like this one on the left here. You have a convolution kernel, just as I explained. You have batch normalization and then some kind of nonlinear activation function. In this case, I've uh, written prelu in there, but it could be something else. It could be relu, leaky relu, sigmoid, whatever you want to have. The batch norm basically is there to normalize your data, and this is important when you go deeper with your networks. When you go deeper, you get problems like vanishing gradients, for example, and to counteract that, um, batch norm is one of the techniques to do that. Now, in a full architecture, you could have something like this, and this is actually something that can be used for contact prediction. Um, it has three stages. The first one, the upper part, is the input stage. Then you have the main backbone of the network and some output part. Now, in the first part up here, um, this is basically a feature compression stage. Now, this is not always needed, but if you have very large inputs, you should have that. And in our case, as I said, some of these samples can be gigabytes in size. And we want to reduce this size very, very quickly because otherwise we will get into memory problems. Okay? So what we do is basically we reduce the amount of feature channels from the five, uh, 441 down to 128 and then even down to 64. And this is what we actually use in the backbone of the network. And these are just one by one convolutions. We simply want to compress in a sophisticated way. Um, then in the actual backbone we're using 5x5 five five convolutions here, um, seven layers in total, 
And in the end, in the output layer, we um, simply use a one-by-one -one convolution again and compress down to the number of channels that we need. In the case of contact prediction, it's just one, and we go into a sigmoid since we want probabilities, right? And uh, for distances, it looks just slightly different. We have not just one output channel, we have B output channels corresponding to the number of bins. And either we um, use softmax here, or we just skip the nonlinear activation function and immediately go into cross-entropy loss. This kind of depends on the framework that you use. Now, um, this is a more plain architecture, and this is already not quite what uh, recent methods use. So what you see in, in the most recent approaches is usually this here. These are residual networks. So this is a bit more sophisticated. Uh, the general structure of the network is still the same, right? We have some input compression stage. Uh, this is a smaller one in this case, it doesn't really matter. But the main backbone is now um, formed from these uh, residual blocks here. And on the left, you see one residual block in detail and how that actually works. So basically, there are a few layers in there. Could be two in this example, but it could just be one. It could be more. This is essentially a new hyperparameter that you introduce if you use residual networks you need to determine what works for your, for your scenario, right? Um, the main point of the residual network, though, is the skipping connection, right? This takes the input from the block and adds it to the output. So we combine both, and it really adds. It's not concatenating, it's adding them, so it's keeping the same size, which is convenient. Um, the idea behind this is that we want to make um, less abstracted information from previous layers available for future layers. If you just go sequentially through that, we kind of lose the le less abstracted information. And this is a very, very powerful technique. If you combine that with batch norm um, and all the other recent advances in deep learning, you can go pretty much arbitrarily deep. And this is what many of the big players do. Google, Facebook, they have really, really deep networks. And this only works because of these techniques. OK, the last thing I want to introduce in deep learning are so-called dilated convolutions. Now, I could say that basically every convolution is a dilated convolution. Uh, the normal ones simply have a dilation factor of 1. Uh, you have that on the left side. That's the default one, 9 by 9. And dilated convolutions are all about the receptive field. Now, the default convolution on the left has a receptive field of 9 by 9 unsurprisingly. Now on the right one we have a dilated convolution. This is 3 by 3. As you can see it's 3 by 3 sample positions but with a dilation factor of 4. This dilation factor tells us how many positions we skip in between our sampling points. Right? So we have four positions skipped in here between, between those points. And the effect of this is that we kind of blow up the receptive field. It's just a 3 by 3 convolution, but we have the same receptive field as the left one. It's 9 by 9. And we still move this thing across the whole input, right? So why would you do that? Well, exactly because of the receptive field. If you want to have a very large receptive field, but you want to be uh, more conservative with your amount of free parameters, for example, because you want to go very, very deep, so you need to be aware of that. You don't want to have these, these 9 by 9 convolutions here, because 9 by 9, that's 81 weights, right? 81 free parameters. Whereas for the dilated convolutions, it's just 9. That's a lot less, right? And if you go very deep, this is very, very relevant. You want to have a large receptive field, but you need to be aware of the amount of free parameters. Okay, so that's about deep learning, pretty much all that we need for today. So let's talk a bit more about CUSP. CUSP was already introduced, so I mostly wanted to tell you where contact prediction sits in between CUSP. So basically, you can think of CUSP as kind of the Olympics of structure prediction, right? And in the Olympics, you also have many different sports categories. They're all kind of related, but uh, in part at least independent, and CUSP is pretty much the same thing. It's all about structure prediction, but we have many different categories in there. Um, the obvious first one, which was always there is, of course, the 3D structure prediction. Um, and there are different subcategories that have been added over the years, like homology modeling, fault recognition, and de novo prediction. Um, and also secondary structure was there from the beginning, but, but uh, was canceled then after CUSP 5. So that's no longer part of it. Um, but many other categories have been added. And one of them is contact prediction since CUSP 4. So this was one of the earliest ones. And then others came, like disordered regions, function, and so on, as you can see here. So many different ways to approach the problem, as you can see. So um, since CUSP 7, we also have different sample categories because they figured out, well, for all of the samples that we have in each challenge, they are actually quite different in their characteristics. So for some of them, we actually have um, many homologous structures. And uh, this forms the category of template-based modeling, right? You can actually find templates. You can use comparative modeling um, in contrast to others where we do not have these. And these are the free modeling targets. This, way, this is where you need some de novo predictions to actually get somewhere. And of course, there are some mixed samples which are 
lying in between. You have some structures, some similar structures that you can use, but not that many. Sometimes these are called TBM hard, sometimes they're called TBM FM. So these are basically sitting in the middle um, and are therefore mostly considered by both approaches from both sides. Okay, so let's talk about metrics. How does CUSP actually compare different methods? How do they do that? Now, in the case of binary contact prediction, obviously you get your true positives, false positives, and so on. So you have your usual suspects here, precision recall, F-score, and uh, the MCC, which is the Markov correlation coefficient, um, which has the advantage of also factoring in the true negatives, right? The, the other three above don't do that. So uh, MCC is quite important. And what we usually do um, in contact prediction is we differentiate between short, medium, and long-range contacts. And we're mostly interested in the long-range contacts, which is everything above a distance of 32 residues on, on the sequence level, right? We do that because we are mostly interested in the long-range contacts, because short range is not so interesting. The, lo the, far, the further away um, two residues are which form a contact, the better the constraint is, right? And this is why, we, why we're looking at long-range exclusively. Or well, not exclusively, but we focus on that during evaluation. Now, is that enough? Can we, can we get away with just these metrics? Or do we need something else? So let's recall, we want to use these contacts or distance maps as constraints for a folding process later on. So there's something more important about this. Precision alone is not going to cut it. So, let's ask you, what would you prefer if you need to choose? Would you try to maximize the amount of true positives in your contact map, let's say, or would you try to minimize the false positives? Now, of course, you want to do both, right? If you can, you want to do both, but let's assume you have to focus on one or the other. What would you do? Can I have a show of hands for maximizing the true positives? Who would do that? Okay. And minimizing the false positives? Slightly more people. Okay, can someone say why? I think it depends on the use, but because we have to do with proteins and it's important whether we do it or not. You don't want to say that protein is of this type if it's not, because that's dangerous. What specifically do you mean? For example, if you want to do protein prediction, you want to predict some protein, and this has a real importance in smoking medicine, you don't want to make a mistake and say, yes, this is of this type, and therefore it's not. Hmm. Yeah, type, I mean, we're trying to predict context, and in the end, structure. Yeah, I yeah. it's the same idea. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Other opinions? Okay, what about networks that only predict very few positives, but those are all correct? So let's say we get five predicted contacts, they're correct, they're true positives, we don't have any false positives. So precision is 100%, right? Is that good? Can we do something with five contacts? What about 20? We have 20 predicted contacts, they're all correct. Okay, 100% precision. Is that enough? Can we infer the full structure with 20 contacts? Okay, when I tell you that the protein has 50 residues, are 20 enough? What about a protein with 800 residues? Are 20 enough? Well, maybe for 50 it is okay. Maybe we can do something with that, but for 800 residues, it's not gonna work, okay? So I was kind of misleading you with that question because the important thing is how long is the protein? We have to kind of factor that in, right? And also precision alone is not gonna help us too much because 100% precision might not be what we want. So there's another metric in CASP that is used uh, as the primary metric for evaluation here, and that's called the top L precision. So we are looking at precision, but with a catch. So what we do is we select L, L being the protein length, most confident long range predictions. Okay, the most confident predictions where we have the highest probability. And we do not care at all if this is actually above the decision threshold. So even if they are below 0.5 in the probability, we still take them. And then we check if those actually uh, correspond with true contacts. 
and we measure the precision of that. Now, why do we do that? Well, first thing, um, we base it on the protein length, so we have kind of a normalization effect, so we can compare results of different proteins with different lengths. But the point is really that we want to have some information about the reliability of the network. Because the point is, we want to use these contacts or distances as constraints for a folding process. We certainly don't want a network that predicts many, many positives, but has a mixed bag of true and false positives, because too many false positives lead to a scenario where we might confuse the actual folding algorithm, and there might be inconsistencies in the contact map or distance map, and this might uh, break the whole process, right? Makes sense, right? So what we want to have is something like this here. Um, the fewer samples we look at, um, only the most confident ones, we would like to have a high precision. And you might think, okay, this is kind of intuitive. We will always have that, and no, we will not always have that. There are predictors which do not work like that. Um, so the fewer we take in, this, these are just the most confident ones we want a really high precision here, and we want to have, well, we want high precision everywhere, but um, we want to have lower precision only if we take in more of these, right? So for a protein with 100 residues, for example, we only take the 10 best ones in here. Uh, these are already 20, 50, 100, and then the precision will drop, of course. Um, now for a few samples, you will always have some predictor which um, does not follow that rule, and oftentimes what you see is you have uh, precision which actually goes up in this direction, but then if you take the most confident ones, they're actually all wrong, and it's zero. You can have something like that. And this happens for some samples, you cannot avoid that, but it should better not happen for your predictor on average, right? This is not what you want. So this is a very important quality criterion for, for contact predictors. Okay, so in terms of recent developments in the CUSP challenge, um, this is pretty much what you would expect uh, when you know a bit about the history of deep learning. So in CUSP 11, this was 2014, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the winner in contact prediction was CONCEPT2. This was from David Jones at UCL in London. Um, as I said, all of these methods uh, were using evolutionary conservation, evolutionary coupling scores, um, and this was still a method which used traditional neural networks, basically with a sliding window approach. Um, but this has changed dramatically over the last few years, so um, CUSP 12 already saw the first deep learning methods. This was 2016. Uh, the winner was Raptor X Contact, which was already a pretty deep um, uh, deep CNN network. And then in CUSP 13, which was pretty recent, this was last year, 2018, um, we've seen further progression there. So we're now at uh, deep residual networks that I've explained to you. So triplet res, uh, Raptex contact um, was second place in this case, a more improved version. Um, so this is uh, certainly the trend of, that will continue. So it's pretty much exclusively deep learning methods which are now leading in the field. Now CUSP 13 was also special because outside the area of contact prediction there was something big happening. Uh, I think Professor Rost already mentioned AlphaFold, right? AlphaFold? Yeah, some people are, are nodding, okay. Um, so AlphaFold was pretty interesting, and well, I can immediately go into that because now we're talking about the modern approaches and AlphaFold is going to be the first one. So AlphaFold is interesting because it was a newcomer in the field. AlphaFold was developed by DeepMind, which is a Google company. And they never did anything in computational biology up to that point, which is unusual, because most methods uh, which perform well in the CUSP challenges are from groups which are working in the field for years, right? This is not new stuff for them. They are very experienced in that. Um, and a newcomer, in this case DeepMind, never really got anywhere in these CUSP challenges. DeepMind did because AlphaFold won in uh, tertiary restructure prediction and they won by a significant margin. So this was quite the thing in the field as you can imagine. And many people were asking, well, okay, what are they doing? And it's hard to figure out what they are doing because they still haven't published the paper as far as I'm aware. Not, nothing there yet, okay. Uh, so we are still waiting in the field and uh, hoping to get some more information on what they actually did. Uh, so everything we know so far about AlphaFold is from presentations that they gave after CUSP 13 in December last year. Um, and they're pretty much exclusively talked about um, their prediction of distance histograms. Lucky for us, because then I can tell you something about that, because I don't really know anything about the other parts of the method. Basically, they're using many different deep residual networks for multiple purposes, and somehow use all these results for repeated gradient descent, whatever that actually is, in fact. So, uh, for the distance prediction part itself, it's actually not that novel it's not that surprising what they do, because they do what everyone, everyone else does as well. They use evolutionary cons conservation information and some additional 1D features like predicted secondary structure and so on accessibility, uh, but this is what other methods do as well. Um, the output in this case is also not explicitly novel. Um, they do distance prediction, so they predict distograms with 64 bins. It's a pretty large amount of bins. Other methods use a bit less than that, but still this is uh, what other people did as well. So what's the difference? 
So let's take a closer look what they actually do in their distance predictor. So they use pretty much everything that are introduced in the deep learning section. So they use dilated residual networks um, and they use cycling with these dilations. This is something that you commonly see. So this is one of these residual blocks. Um, what you see is they have three layers in there. The first and the last are basically just, uh, well, layers which, which scale the amount of feature channels. So the main backbone has 128 and they bring it down to 64 for the core of this block and then expand it again to 128. This apparently works well for them. And the actual core is the 3 by 3 dilated convolution in the center. It's always going to be 3 by 3 but they're cycling the dilation factors. It's going to be 1, then 2, then 4, then 8 in successive blocks and they're cycling through this the whole time, through the whole architecture. Now, and this is the novel thing, they use 220 of these blocks, and this is a lot, right? So if you actually compute the number of layers in there, you have to remember there are three layers in each of these blocks, so you have pretty much over 600 layers in there. So this is very, very deep, and no one else in the field used deep networks like that uh, for a reason, <laughs> so we will get to that on the next slide. Um, and we also have 21 million free parameters, which is actually not that much, and this is because it's dilated convolutions, right? You save up some parameters. If you wouldn't do that, it would be much larger. The input again. What's the input again? The input in this case? <laughs> We're getting to that, okay? <laughs> We're getting to that. Uh, it's, it's basically evolutionary coupling scores as well as other methods do, but with a catch. And this is exactly the point. I'm getting to that right now because um, if you have such a deep network, you could be wondering, okay, but the input size is so large and we always have L times L, even if we compress the feature channels down, how could they get away with so many? I mean, they're still using 128 in the backbone and then and then shortly boil it down to 64, but still a lot. If you push L times L through that, through 220 of those blocks, why do they not run out of memory? How do they do this? And they don't do this, they cannot do this. So what they instead do is they do not train on L times L. They train on crops with size 64 by 64. And this is actually novel. I've not seen that anywhere else. So this is what uh, Alpha Fold really uh, does exclusively. Um, and they have to do this because otherwise they couldn't use such a very deep architecture, right? Because 64 by 64, well, that's feasible. You can do that. It's pretty much at the edge of what you can do with most recent hardware. Tesla cards, 32 gigabytes, I think is the maximum right now. And this is exactly what fits in there. They couldn't make the architecture deeper. This is right at the limit. Now. They're taking these crops um, with random offsets up to 32 residues off edge. Uh, you need to do that because during inference and test time, you want to sample many of these crops. Obviously, you have to span the full volume, right? And uh, you need to go off edge a little bit because otherwise you would have less positions to average on, on the edges and in the corners, right? So your accuracy would drop there. Um, so it's important to go a little bit off edge to, re to avoid that. Um, the DeepMind guys actually say that they do this because of data augmentation. I'm not 100% sure if, they, if, they really, if, if, if this is really data augmentation, because if you imagine you push the full L times L sample through, you're going to visit every position anyway with your convolution kernels, right? So I'm not quite sure. You could say, well, okay, now since they're using mini batches, which you can do now since you have a fixed size, um, you could say, okay, since you sample from different L times L um, inputs, you could say, well, okay, it, may, it might be data augmentation, but I think the core reason really is the memory consumption. They need to do this, otherwise it wouldn't work. So I checked if this actually works. So I used a network which I trained on the full inputs, inferring the full outputs, and then simply used cropping for the evaluation to see uh, how much does performance actually drop if you take different crop sizes and different strides, which means different amounts of overlap, right? And the surprising thing is really you can, you can go down very, very far without losing any kind of accuracy. So the baseline performance, by the way, I should have added this as well, was 0.6. So if you infer with the full input, producing the full output, you get 0.6. Um, and with a crop size of 64, you get 0.6 as well. It doesn't matter. 64 by 64 is perfectly fine. You do not need more. And this is kind of a surprise because uh, many people probably thought that you need to have a larger receptive field. You need to factor in more information, at least for the long range context, right? For short range, maybe not, but for long range, you probably would have, but apparently not. And you can go down even further. You can go down to 32 and even 16. Even 16 is enough as long as you have enough overlap. And this was kind of surprising, so it works quite well. Now, can we reproduce that? Can we do that as well in a small lab? And the problem is we can't. And this is, this is a big issue because, I mean, how to do that is pretty obvious, right? You take crops. 
how would you do that in practice? Because now you have these inputs, L times L times 441, and you want to have, let's say, a mini batch size of 100. So you want 100 of these crops, 64 by 64, but how do you get them? Well, you need to load the full sample in, cut out your crop, but pretty much throw away the rest of the information, save that one crop, load the next one, and you want to do this 100 times, you're not going to do that. Not per training iteration, you cannot do that. It's not fast enough. And you have the problem that you cannot read it in, 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 a more, in, in a more sophisticated way because it's a 3D tensor, right? You cannot read anything sequentially out of this. So you really have to load the full thing in. So that doesn't work. So maybe we can pre-generate the crops. If you cannot do it dynamically during training, maybe you can just generate all possible crops. These are just 64 by 64 times 441. Okay, it's still not small, but we can load this in relatively fast. How many crops would we have for a protein with 500 residues? We have roughly 500 times, times 500 crops with a depth of 441 channels. So that's a lot. That's a lot of disk space that you would use. Um, it's completely unfeasible. And we still want to have fast access speeds, right? We still want this to be on an SSD if possible. So that's an issue. Any ideas how to circumvent that? Any compromise? Something we could do? Something which makes it feasible without having a full data center? Yeah? Yeah, more resources, exactly, yeah. And it's also obvious why DeepMind was able to do that. They probably have the resources, right? Yeah. Smaller labs probably don't have that. So that's actually an issue, and um, I'm wondering how the field will, will develop further, because it might be that we actually get to a point where further progress can only be achieved by more computational resources, and that means that smaller labs cannot participate anymore. I hope it's not getting there. I hope clever ideas still succeed more, but maybe we need clever ideas plus the computational resources. might come to that. I hope it's not. Okay, so let's take a look at a more, at a more realistic approach, something that could be implemented by a smaller lab. Um, and uh, I don't want to hide the fact, this is from my master thesis, so this is what I developed. Uh, basically what I showed during the deep learning introduction, the residual network that you saw is exactly the architecture that I used with some additions, and I'm gonna talk about that now. Basically to show you how you could implement something like that and what you need to think about in this case. So the first thing you need to do is, uh, when you want to develop a machine learning device, is you need to think about data. Data is the most important thing. Um, if your data is garbage, then you get garbage out, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Um, so luckily the data set was already prepared in this case. I hadn't had, it didn't have to, uh, have to do this myself. Um, basically we had a bit over 4,000 high quality structures from PDB with some constraints, only single chains for example. Um, no metals in there, a certain resolution at least that we wanted to have. And we're starting with the faster files. We're using tools like uh, HHSuit, which is one of the tools to generate multiple sequence alignments. We filter them a little bit to remove some redundancy and convert that and ultimately use CCMPRED, which is one of the uh, DCA tools to compute the evolutionary coupling scores. Um, and then we get these L times L times 441 tensors out of that, which are the main inputs of the network. Um, the underlying databases that were used are Uniclass 30 and a metagenomics database um, for which we had some access, uh, which was nice because we had basically alternative versions of the MSAs and could do some analysis on that. Now what you immediately have to think about is also what is my validation set and what are the final evaluation sets, the holdout sets, the ones that are only touched at the very end, right? So for a validation set, uh, we simply selected a fixed random selection of roughly 200 samples. And for the final evaluation sets, uh, we have some data sets which are perfectly suitable for that. Uh, one is the Psycho 150 set, which is used uh, at UCL um, from David Jones for, for most of his methods and from methods from its group. So this is a good candidate. And then of course we can use CASP, right? We can use the free modeling targets from the recent CASP uh, challenges, CASP 12 and CASP 13 specifically, and compare with a variety of other methods. Now what's important obviously is that you need to redundancy reduce. So you definitely don't want any training sample in your training set that has any kind of similarity with anything in the validation set and especially not with the final evaluation set. Um, now in this case it's pretty easy to do because these CASP targets for example are by definition new structures, right? They weren't there before and they were free modeling targets so there also aren't any uh, similar sequences out there. Okay, so what I tried to do was not only use the evolutionary coupling scores, but also go in this direction of trying to move away from evolutionary information. And as Michael did for secondary structure prediction, I also used ELMO embeddings, if you recall them. So briefly, what are ELMO embeddings? 
LM embeddings basically are the hidden states of a bidirectional LSTM, um, a system which was originally introduced for natural language processing and has been adopted by us for bioinformatics. Basically, the idea is to predict the next or the previous word in a sentence, or in the context of bioinformatics, the next or the previous residue. So the training process is pretty much the same. We're just training on biodatabases instead of natural language, uh, natural language corpus. And then after training, we simply extract these hidden representations, which are essentially a 1D representation of a protein. And we were trying to do something with them and see if this actually performs uh, better than evolutionary coupling scores. <laughs> Maybe not, but at least to see how well does it perform if we add them on top of that. So if we want to add them, we are facing one problem, a more technical problem, because these are 1D features. And we're having a 2D pipeline. So how do we get the 1D features in the 2D pipeline? Well, there's a simple naive way to do that, and it's not so naive apparently because AlphaFold does the same thing with their 1D inputs. So if you have L times something, and in this case for Elmo embeddings it's L times 1K, uh, you can simply expand that. You simply duplicate in one direction so you get L times L times the depth that you have. Um, but you also do not do this just in one direction, you also do the same thing in the other direction and then you concatenate so you basically get this pairwise information that you need in your 2D pipeline. Right? Now, the problem is, Elmo representations are L times 1K. Now, if you duplicate and then concatenate, we basically have L times L times 2K. This is very, very big. We do not want that, okay? So what we do is we basically use a feature compression stage just as we used for the evolutionary coupling scores. So we bring it down to 128 and then 64 channels and then we duplicate. And then simply concatenate both and uh, continue with the 2D pipeline. Now, there's a small mistake here in the slide. Uh, this looks like I'm using the, the normal CNN architecture. Um, just imagine that this is actually the residual architecture, right? This is what I used. Okay, so let's look at some results. So, how do we fare if we only use evol evolutionary coupling scores versus evolutionary coupling scores plus ELMO inputs? Now, let's first explain what you actually see here. So, this is a per sample comparison based on the MCC, the Markov correlation coefficient. And you have some color coding for these samples according to the quality of the underlying sequence alignment. So the more rich the multiple sequence alignment is, the more bluish the color is going to be, and the more sparse it's going to be, so just a few sequences in there, the more reddish it's going to be. Now the first observation obviously is the performance in general for both networks is higher for the ones where the MSA is better. This is unsurprising, this is exactly what we expect. And for the ones where we have very poor alignments, the quality of the predictions is not going to be very well. Right? So let's compare both. So if you just use a ResNet with evolutionary coupling scores, we see there's not a big difference between the one with the ELMO inputs in general for the samples, but we see something interesting down here. Right? So for some samples, especially ones which aren't that high here on the scale, uh, the original ResNet without the ELMO inputs was not able to infer any kind of contacts. Right? Zero. But for the one with the ELMOs, we actually get something out. Not really stellar performance, but at least that's something, right? Now, what happens if we only train on ELMO compared to a system trained on both inputs? Well, as you can see, well, the system with both inputs is still vastly superior. But we have an interesting story here as well. We have a few samples for which we actually perform to some degree where the combined network didn't do anything. This is kind of surprising, right? Why could that be? Because here it kind of makes sense, right? We didn't use ELMO for, for the one network, but here we use both inputs. So what happens here? Actually, it turns out, if we analyze this further, these are actually very bold predictions. So this goes back to the point that I made earlier, right? We do, really do not want a predictor that predicts many positives, but many of those are false. And this is exactly what happens here. So uh, the, the result basically was, if you use ELMO only, you get a very bold predictor, and this is very unfeasible for, for actually inferring the full 3D structure in the end. Sadly, but that's how it is. Still, in general, if you look at the performance comparison, such a residual network performs reasonably well. So this is a comparison of, of our method with MetaCycov2 and DeepCov. These are two methods from uh, UCL, from David Jones' lab. Um, and CCMPRED as kind of a baseline performance. I didn't include random baseline because random is just extremely low, right? Because it's so unbalanced. Most, you have mostly negatives and only a few positives. So CCMPRED is a good baseline here in this case. 
And this is on the Psycho 550 set, uh, unsurprisingly, because this is what's also used for the evaluation of meta of 2 and Deepkov, so it makes sense to compare with that. And this is also an especially fair comparison, because this not only uses the same samples in terms of the same sequences, it also uses the same MSAs. So it was not generating new MSAs in this case, it's exactly the same thing. Um, as you can see here, even um, when considering the error margin, uh, such a residual architecture is working quite well. Now when we look at CAST12, and I'm sorry this is a wall of numbers, but uh, I'm going to go through that. So on CAST12 the story is a bit different. So what you see here in each row is one sample. This is also a per sample comparison. Uh, what you also see here is basically the same thing as the color coding from the, from the other graphs. This indicates how, how good the underlying alignment is. And as you can see here for the CUSP-12 targets, these are just free modeling targets. And as expected for free modeling targets, uh, the quality of the alignments is not particularly good. right? So we have very many um, hard samples in there and just a few where we actually have a high score. And even that is not really a guarantee that we get good performance out of this. So this is um, a comparison between MetaCycov, RaptorX Contact, and our implementation. MetaCycov and RaptorX Contact are the two winners of CAST12 in contact prediction, so it made sense to compare with them. And in bold, you see the uh, best scores for each respective sample in each respective top L category. Now, if you just take a glance at it and see where you have more bold parts, you can see that pretty much any predictor has certain strengths and weaknesses, so it's hard to say that anyone is better than the other. Um, there are some samples where uh, one predictor is performing very well, for example, here for, for MetaCycov, where our predictor didn't do anything really here. Um, and vice versa. Now, what I want to do here is highlight one specific sample and make one last point, and then we're going to close for today. And that is this sample here. This is a prominent one because our predictor was performing reasonably well on this one, while the others struggled a little bit. But this also showcases a shortcoming of the top L precision, because not everything is well with top L. So this is what the sample looks like. So smallish protein. You can see here um, in the top left, first a visualization of the predictions of the contacts and uh, the corresponding ground truth. And as you can see here, the long range contacts, so the ones further away from the diagonal, are pretty much restricted to this region here. And we only infer a part of it, right? And the full structure has a lot more in there. Still, the top edge precision is pretty high. So what is happening here? So if you look at the full structure and actually visualize the long-range contacts that we got in this case, they all concentrated on this region here. So that's an issue. That's not good, right? Because if you want to infer the full structure afterwards, you have the issue that you might be able to model this one here correctly, but about the rest, no idea, right? So this will probably not work well. Um, so this is something to really keep in mind when you're looking at uh, top L precision, and it really uh, reinforces the point that you need to look at several different metrics to get a full picture of it. Yeah. Long range, what that means? Um, it means that long range is defined as everything that is above 23 residues on the sequence level. So when you look at the sequence and you're looking at a contact between two residues, it's long range if they are 23, at least 23 residues apart. And that's important because the, the further they are away, the better the constraint is. Because if we know these are in contact, then we already know this is kind of forming such a loop. Then we have an, maybe another contact in between, and this already constrains the structure a lot, right? The degrees of freedom are reduced then. How large is this 500, 500 times 500 data set you speak about earlier? 500 times 500? Uh, the alpha, um, alpha fold data set that is. Um, uh, you, you mean the crops, right? Where I mentioned that we have kind of 500 times 500 crops. Well, that's simply the result. If, if you have 500 residues and you think about how many crops can you cut out of that, it's going to be roughly 500 times 500 different In crops. Gigabytes, how large? I didn't actually calculate it, but it's definitely above a dozen, if not hundreds of terabytes. It's really large. You can do the math. I mean, let's assume you have a couple thousand samples, and let's say on average they are 300 residues long, which is kind of default between 200 and 300. Just do the math. It's going to be large. It's too large, definitely. Yeah. Recall that it's also, it has a depth of 441, right? Don't forget that. So that's, that's the issue. Yeah. Sorry? What? what is the 441? 441? That's the amount of feature channels that you have. And this results from, let me quickly go back to that to illustrate that. So basically, you have, there you go. 
So what you do is when you when you um, use these DCA tools, CCMPRED or something else to compute these correlation scores, you basically get values for, for, for each residue pair. Um, you get uh, 21 times 21 different features because you have 20 amino acids plus one gap character and you want the correlation scores for all possible combinations. So this is 21 times 21 and this is 441 channels. 